So this picture was taken a couple summers ago as I attended a family reunion and I had a lot of fun on this rope swing. And if you think about all the things that are happening on an organismal level, me being the organism, in order for this to take place. Now you can see there are many body parts involved and a lot of that you can see and that's part of the anatomy. Uh, the physiology part you can't really see so that's how things are occurring how the anatomy is being used um, I obviously had to have some muscle coordination going on here which must have been coordinated by a nervous system so that all the moving parts could coordinate together I was breathing I was probably breathing at an accelerated rate due to adrenaline some sort of hormone produced by an endocrine hormone. My blood was circulating at an increased rate as well. The um, less obvious ones were probably also occurring. My kidneys were probably still filtering my blood. My digestive system was probably still uh, digesting and absorbing food. And my metabolism in general was at work. All of these things are occurring on the organismal level constantly. And that's what anatomy and physiology is. But we are going to break things down into uh, different parts and study them in parts um, and understand then how those parts help the whole. So this is the first of two courses in anatomy and physiology covering the human body. And um, until you finish anatomy and physiology one and two, you won't really have a complete picture of all these systems, what they're doing and how they help uh, a body function. But um, each individual part is very important to that complete understanding. So again, like I said, anatomy is looking at the structure. So what are the different parts um, of the body? And you can look at them on many different levels. And at each level, it can become very, very complicated, very, very detailed, um, because there are a lot of moving parts that need to come together in order to allow for function or allow for physiology. We are studying these two subjects together, anatomy and physiology, because once you learn the anatomy, it just kind of goes in a natural way to understand, all right, well, what is this anatomy used for? Uh, what is its function? Um, <clears throat> I must also mention that throughout this course, we'll be using this OpenStax textbook. All of the pictures, I should say most of the pictures in these YouTube uh, videos are from this book. This is an open source book. Anyone can access it for free. I've put the link there at the bottom. There are a few other pictures which I gathered from um, open source references. But for the most part, I'm sticking to the book. So if you want a more clear picture of what I'm talking about, you can reference the book for that. Now, anatomy, again, is studied on many different levels. There are seven different levels of organization by which we are going to look at anatomy. The, sh the smallest is at the um, atomic level, so how elements react with each other. And this is going to be to a lesser extent. We aren't really going to study this too much, but there are some chemical reactions which are very important. Um, those atoms then are important for creating molecules and macromolecules. Macromolecules are definitely important for um, the physiology and function of our anatomy. Um, and uh, we then go from there to the cellular level, to the tissue level, organ level, organs working together in organ systems, and finally the complete organism. So those are seven levels, six of which, you know, this first one we won't do too much, but six of which are very um, important. We can divide these seven levels into gross or macroscopic. These are levels in which you can see with your own eyes. So you can see a whole organism, you can see a whole human, you can see a system, you can see a 
Um, you can see an organ. You can even see some tissues. But to understand <clears throat> more about these tissues, you may need to go to the microscopic level, which is levels that you can't see with the naked eye. You need some sort of tool or instrument, usually a microscope, in order to see those. Um, and so our cellular and, and tissue level are generally studied on that microscopic level. You can also look at the anatomy in a regional um, uh, way, and we will be doing that as well. You have you know, the arm. We'll look at the muscles of the arm. That's a region of the body in which we'll study things. And we will definitely be going through things systematically through these organ systems. Um, the systems we will cover in Anatomy and Physiology 1 are the integumentary system, the skeletal system, the muscular system, and the nervous system. So uh, not as many systems in AMP1 because we do have um, some of these smaller microscopic things to study first. Um, and then the, the rest and the bulk of the systems you'll study in anatomy and physiology too. Uh, so again, those systems that we're going to study, the muscular system, the nervous system, the skeletal system, and the integumentary system. Um, those four, uh, and then the rest of these we'll study in anatomy and physiology too. Although there is going to be some uh, when we look at physiology, there is some dependence on other systems in order to understand um, the, the system you're studying. So, for example, the, the skeletal system and the muscular system are very tied together because of all muscles are attached to bones at some point. <coughs> Sorry, there's the skeletal system up here. So, in, um, in studying... Uh, the anatomy and physiology of the human body. Um, you go back in time to some of the first uh, ancient studies, you know, um, people are able to name, you know, the different parts of the body. Understanding how things work is a little harder. Um, but through dissection and, and even some vivisection of animals at least, be able to understand more about how things work. However, um, many of the dissection parts in studying systems or anatomy or physiology um, requires the death of the subject. Um, but in the recent 100, 200 years or so, uh, a number of imaging techniques have allowed us to understand internal anatomy without having to kill someone or without having that subject to be dead. We, I'm not sure if there's many times where someone has been killed just to study them. Um, so some of these include the x-ray image, which was discovered by Wilhelm Rontgen. Um, and just by chance, he was playing, experimenting with these x-rays and discovered that if you put a film that was sensitive to these x-rays um, and then passed these x-rays through some sort of subject, such as your hand, um, that this film that was sensitive to them would have different um, images based on what was in front of it. And this had a uh, specific application, of course, to the internal anatomy of a person. So more dense structures in a, a human subject in an x-ray will show up white because it is being reflected and it's not um, reacting with the film, whereas less dense structures will go through, more x-rays will go through, and so it will be um, black um, or darker. So lungs and fat are going to be darker, uh, bones and organs are going to be lighter, uh, bones are more dense than the tissue in this hand, so the bones are lighter than the tissue, and then where there was only air, it's completely dark. Other imaging techniques were soon to follow after the x-ray, um, including the CT scan, which really is just a complex integration of lots of x-rays um, 
taken at different points and in different uh, planes to come up with a, a, a more detailed image. So these are a bunch of CT scans here. Uh, the development of magnetic resonance imaging allowed for um, 3D images to be produced using magnetic and radio waves to form images and that involves this large tube like machine. However, using magnetic um, waves and properties can um, mess with or alter somebody's you know, metal parts if they have them. So if somebody has a pacemaker with metal components within it, they cannot do an MRI or it will kill them. Uh, a positron emission tomography scan uses radioactive substances which a person generally eats. Um, and they will be labeled or injected in their bloodstream. It will be labeled with this radioactive material, which will then image, uh, be able to use to make an image as it releases radiation. Um, so glucose can be used. You can label it with some tritium, which is radioactive, and then you can see where that glucose is being used in different parts of the brain or the body. And all of these form static images, right? Where it's just one point in time, generally. An ultrasound, however, allows us to make a live image. The most notable um, procedure in which an ultrasound is used is during pregnancy to determine how the health of a developing baby. baby. Um, uh, an ultrasound uses sound waves or sonar then to form images much like radar works. Um, it's just in a very fine specific way and it allows then you to form an image and see how it moves so a three dimension well two dimensional image but you can move it around to different areas um, but also see how it changes over time okay so those are then imaging techniques uh, here's an example of an ultrasound this was actually done on my wife um, from one of our children um, and you can see different things here. You can see there's the hand moving. Um, let's see, there's the face and the belly, a little hand here. Um, and there's the two feet here. And a leg. And that's that. So if you are able to determine the sex, if you are a very advanced radiologist, um, who worked on ultrasounds all day, you might be, have been able to catch that, but they really didn't focus on it too much. This was a boy. I'm sure you guessed that. Okay, one of the big fundamentals of physiology. We're trying to understand how things work. Well, the functions of or the goal of physiology is to keep you alive. And really all that is is homeostasis. So keeping your body within a range of conditions in which you will be able to continue living, right? So we have negative and, and positive feedback loops, which are important for, you know, if we're getting too hot, it allows us to cool down, or if we're, um, our blood is getting um, too acidic to make it more basic. Um, and these involve a stimulus sensor control and an effector. We'll go over this more in class. Um, but, but in order to do that, it's going to have to have mechanisms in place to do that. So you're going to have biochemistry, certain enzymes, certain chemicals and reactions which are going to occur, which are going to either maintain homeostasis or return back to a homeostasis or do an altered state of homeostasis, such as during childbirth. Um, and again, homeostasis is met through a series of reactions generally um, that are called metabolic pathways. Um, metabolism then is the sum of those metabolic pathways or more specifically the sum of the chemical reactions within a subject, within the body. Um, and those can be breaking down into two different types of reactions. You can have a catabolic reaction, uh, catabolism, which is where you take complex organism, um, complex molecules and break them down into more simple molecules. And generally that will release energy. Um, so that's what we do when we eat food. We take 
complex um, carbs or proteins or lipids, we break them down and as we do so, release energy, which allows us to convert that to ATP. But uh, when we want to use that ATP, um, we may use it then to build something that we need. So if we want to need to build muscle, that would be an anabolic reaction where we're taking bits and pieces of amino acids, we're putting them together to make a protein, which has an important function in our body. So you have uh, an anabolic reaction where you're making something more complex that generally requires energy, and you have catabolic reactions where you're breaking things apart into smaller pieces and that releases energy. Okay, so that's anatomy and physio physiology in a nutshell. One of the things, however, we need to establish when studying anatomy are some terms to understand um, positions of the body. So we're going to start by talking about body planes. So if you're going to cut the body or not necessarily cut it, but if you're going to split it into different sections, there are different planes in which you can do that because we are a three-dimensional image. So this is, if this is you over here, and if you were going to divide this body, look at things from left to right, that would be called a sagittal section. If the uh, section is cut um, completely down the middle, it's called a mid-sagittal section, so that would be that one right there. If it's off to the right or left, then it would be a parasagittal section. Well, you could also split the body into front and bottom halves, and that would be creating a transverse section or going through the transverse plane, um, uh, which would be a horizontal cut and would create a cross section is what you would call that um, that view. Um, then the third plane that you could cut, you could or you could divide the body into a front and back half, and that would be going through the frontal plane. So if I was facing to the right in this picture, um, you would cut down the side on a front to back cut, and that would create a coronal view or through the coronal plane. Okay, so a mid-sagittal cut down the middle. Um, these are important terms to know and understanding um, different uh, views of the body through the different body planes. And this is the figure from your book showing those then three planes, the frontal, transverse, and sagittal plane. All right, so uh, in relative terms, you're going to have to understand which way to direct the body or um, understand parts in relation to each other. Um, we can't use terms like up and down because if a specimen is, you know, laying on a table, what does up and down mean? Does that mean towards the head? Does that mean towards the belly? We don't know. So we need more standard terms. So what we have are um, the terms superior and inferior. So that means towards, superior means towards the top, inferior means towards the bottom. Anterior and posterior then means towards the front or the belly and posterior towards the back. And then cranial and caudal means similar to superior and inferior towards the head or towards the tail. We don't really have a tail, so it's really towards our butt. And dorsal and ventral, which means similar to anterior and posterior, uh, towards the back is dorsal and towards the belly is ventral. So some of these have the same terms, but you may hear in one instance uh, an anterior, something is, is mentioned as anterior, um, and then it's ventral um, in another term. So there's, um, for example, there's the um, superior vena cava, which is a part of the uh, large vein which empties into the heart. It is um, coming from the head down to the heart, so it would be superior or above the heart. Um, or there's also a group of muscles called the serratus ventralis. This is um, near the ribs, goes towards the belly, 
So it is a serrated group of muscles that is towards the ventral side. Okay, so these are used in the naming of different um, anatomical structures. Now uh, these terms of locality change if um, you are talking about a human specimen versus a cat specimen. Now we are going to be using minks in this class, not cats, um, but the, the same principles apply here for the cat. So for some reason, I don't know who named this, but because humans stand on two feet and are bipedal, some of these terms are slightly different. So cranial still means towards the head in both, and caudal still means towards the tail in both, and dorsal still means towards the back, and ventral still means towards the belly. But superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior actually have different meanings, whether you're talking about a human or a cat. In humans, it means towards the head. In uh, cats or minks, it's going to mean towards the back. In inferior means towards the tail, and in cats, it means towards the belly. Anterior means uh, towards the belly in humans, and it means towards the head in cats. Posterior means towards the back or dorsal, and it means towards the tail. So this can get confusing. We're going to be doing these dissections, and you may see some um, differences in these, uh, whether you're looking at a mink or a cat or a human. Uh, but for the most part, this will only rear its head in lab for the most part. Uh, pretty much most of the time, we're going to just be talking about using the human nomenclature, but it can get confusing if that does come up in lab. Now you'll know. All right, so some more terms for locality. Medial means towards the middle. Lateral means away from the middle. Uh, you can have bilateral, which would mean you have um, two sides which are exactly the same uh, in shape. So if you cut somebody down a mid-sagittal cut, it would create bilateral sides, a right and left. Ipsilater ipsilateral are structures on the same side. Your right arm and your right leg are ipsilateral. Contralateral would be on the opposite side. Um, your right arm and your left leg are on contralater are contralateral to each other. Superficial means towards the outside, so your skin is superficial. Deep is on the inside, so your bones are deep compared to your skin. Proximal means close to the point of attachment. Distal means away, so your fingers are distal to your shoulder joint. Your elbow is proximal to your shoulder joint, talking to relation in relation to each other. All right, there is uh, also a term called anatomical position. This is the a standard position for observing a, uh, a anatomical specimen in completion. So you have a whole body or a cadaver in front of you. Um, the position is face up, feet at shoulder width, palms up, and toes forward. So this figure on the right is in the anatomical position. Uh, face down means prone or pronate. Um, that would not be anatomical. Well, this is important for medical procedures. If you're going to, you know, uh, amputate somebody's leg, you need to make sure they are in the anatomical position as opposed to the pronate position, or you're going to amputate the wrong leg, which has happened before. All right, so when we start to then get to the smaller portions within the body, one of the things we need to look at are the ana um, sorry, the body cavities. There are two major body cavities, your dorsal body cavity, which contains the space for your brain and spinal cord. A cavity then is just a space. So we're not talking about the brain and spinal cord, but the space um, in which they reside. The other body cavity is the ventral body cavity, and this contains our thoracic cavity, which has our lungs and heart. And then you have a diaphragm, which separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity, which you can then split into the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. There is no actual physical separation here. Um, there's just kind of an imaginary line there, which separates them. 
Um, but there is a physical separation between the thoracic and an abdominal pelvic cavity, and that is the diaphragm. Okay, within these cavities, you have uh, specialized structures called membranes, which secrete fluid to prevent friction. A membrane is, is an organ, the smallest type of organ, because it has two or more tissues that line a surface. Uh, surface yeah. Serous membranes um, do not open into the outside, and um, they are all along the surface. Each cavity has a visceral cirrhosis, serosa, which is a serous membrane, and a parietal serosa, the other type. The visceral surrounds the organs and the parietal serosa surrounds the whole cavity. So there are a few different types. We have the thoracic cavity, um, which has a visceral pleura, covers the lungs, and the parietal pleura, which covers the walls of the thoracic cavity. <clears throat> we also have another cavity surrounding the heart. And this is called the vis visceral pericardium. And then the, lining the whole area is the parietal pericardium. And then the abdominal pe pelvic cavity has its own visceral peritoneum, which aligns lines the abdominal pelvic organs and the parietal peritoneum, which lines the whole cavity wall. So these are the different serous membranes within those cavities. Now the um, visceral pericardium and parietal pericardium are formed through the heart basically being put into a double lined sac. And so it looks kind of like this, kind of like a fist pushing down on a balloon. That's what forms this pericardium. And it creates this uh, space or this cavity then between the visceral and parietal pericardia. All right. Um, <clears throat> another way we can look at um, a more specific part, the abdominal pelvic cavity, is through separating them into quadrants. So four different areas. Um, and again, this is just an imaginary line. Um, this is where all the organs are, visceral organs. Um, most of them are, not the vital organs. Um, and so we, we do this to understand, again, the location of these organs. We have a right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower and left lower quadrant. Pretty easily named, easy to remember. Um, but this might help us understand where somebody might be um, having uh, appendicitis, right? So some sort of appendix, which would occur in this right lower quadrant. Um, or a hernia, which may occur anywhere uh, among these um, intestines. We can further divide these same abdominal pelvic uh, regions into nine, right? And these have more um, specific names, hypochondriac, uh, hypo meaning below, chondro referring to the ribs, epigastric above the gastric, above the stomach, left hypochondriac, right lumbar, lumbar is the region and it's also named after the vertebrae or the vertebrae are named after that left lumbar umbilical which is be where your belly button is hypogastric would be below that so we have epi above hypo below and left and right iliac region so in what regions are the liver well we we would go right hypochondriac and epigastric and a little bit in the left hypochondriac and which regions are contralateral to the left hypochondriac region? Well, it would be all these ones on the right since, hypo, since contralateral means the opposite side. All right, this kind of looks like a game uh, that you might be familiar with called tic-tac-toe. So one of the things you might wanna do at home is play a game of tic-tac-toe with your buddy um, who's also in this class but only using these nine abdominal pelvic region names. So uh, if SVU was playing uh, BYU at this epic game, I'm sure SVU could form a tic-tac-toe club and play them. SVU goes first, and of course we're gonna pick the middle region, which is umbilical, 
BYU would pick right lumbar or somewhere else. doesn't really matter. They aren't very smart over there. Um, and we, of course, are going to what seems like a, a dumb move, the left lumbar. Um, who knows what BYU is doing? They choose epigastric. I think they're trying to make a trap there. But ours is going to work first because we're going to pick the left hypochondriac. Now we've got them in a good spot, whether they go right hypochondriac or left iliac. Um, or, or right iliac, sorry. Right iliac or left iliac. We've got it made. They block us there. We go left iliac and we win. Go Knights. It doesn't matter the size of the school. We're just smarter, okay? All right, and then we have hypogastric hypogastric and right hypochondriac, which weren't used in this game. So anyway, that's a good exercise you might use. Um, and it's fun, right? All right, last thing, last introductory anatomical structure thing that we need to go over are the regions of the body. I'm not going to actually go over these, but or at least not all of them. But these are also important for naming things, for understanding different parts of the body. Uh, the patellar region is talking about the kneecap, and that's because the patella is the name of the new kneecap. The pubis is looking at the pubic region. That's where your two hip bones meet. Gluteal region refers to the buttocks, right? All right, so these are ones we'll also go over in class a little bit and have some fun with. And this has been a great first lecture in anatomy and physiology. And um, we'll see you in class.